Hello and welcome to today's live event, Rainforests of the Sea, the importance of coral reef ecosystems. This live stream event today is presented by Earth Echo International and Scientist in Every Florida School. Scientist in Every Florida School's mission is to engage Florida K through 12 students and teachers in cutting edge, edge research by providing science role models and experiences that inspire the future stewards of our planets. Visit their website to check out all their programs and opportunities available, including how to request a scientist visit to your Florida classroom. Earth Echo International is a global nonprofit founded on the belief that youth have the power to change our planet. Reaching more than 2 million people in 146 countries, Earth Echo provides original content, immersive experiences, and trusted resources to empower young people to become leaders and problem solvers in their communities and around the world. Now, I just wanna go through some housekeeping to remind everybody viewing out there that you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our guest expert, JD, this afternoon. So please go ahead, use that chat space on YouTube to ask your questions. And while you're there, tell us where you're joining us from. We're so excited to have you. All right, without further ado, why don't we go ahead and get started? Now, I want to introduce our guest expert, JD, today. JD, how are you doing out there? Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're joining us from? Yeah, so thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Casey. Like she just said, my name is JD Rimba, and I am currently calling you all from the Florida Keys, more specifically down in Tavernier, Florida, where I work as the volunteer coordinator for the Coral Restoration Foundation. So that's a very brief summary of who I am. <laughs> awesome, JD. We're so excited to have you with us today. Thank you for taking the time to join us to talk about okay. biodiversity in the coral reefs and why coral reef ecosystems are so important. So JD, why don't we go ahead and get started with our topic du jour today. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the presentation over to you if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Sounds good to me. We all know how much we love technology these days, right? <laughs> <laughs> can you see that, Casey? I can, yes. Awesome. So without further ado, um, again, my name is JD Reinba, and today I'm gonna be talking to you all a little bit more about the overall biodiversity that coral reef ecosystems play for us, not only as human beings, but also for the numerous organisms that live in and around reef ecosystems, as well as in the ocean in general. Now, before we start talking about all this biodiversity and looking at reefs as a whole, I kind of wanted to take a moment to focus in and give you all a bit of a crash course on your basic coral anatomy and some really cool coral biology. So we can go ahead and start off and look at corals themselves. And now, first and foremost, corals are actually an animal. They are, I wanna say a living, breathing organism, but it's weird to think of an organism breathing underwater, but they are an animal. A lot of individuals will go out and see corals, whether they're down here in the Keys, they're in an aquarium or really anywhere, and see this hard structure underwater and often think that it's a rock. And while it does look like a rock, I want you all to take away from this presentation that it is in fact an organism and it is an animal. And looking at that scientific classification, they belong to a phylum that is known as Nidaria. Some of you may know some other Nidarians. We can look at things more like our corals, but a lot of the other common organisms that belong to Nidaria include your jellyfish, as well as your sea anemones. And this phylum Nidaria contains over 10,000 different organisms that can be found in both fresh and saltwater environments. And when looking at it a step further, we can see that this phylum is subsequently broken down into four uh, classes, which is your anthozoa, your scyphozoa, your cubozoa, and your hydrozoa. You can remember those however you want. My middle school teacher had a really weird song that we all had to sing. Don't worry, I'm not gonna sing for all of you. But with this presentation, we're really gonna be focusing in on our anthozoas, which again, include the corals that we're gonna be looking at. This is a coral for those who have never seen one before. But I really wanted to take a moment to actually break down this coral and what you're actually looking at. In this image, you can see a really healthy arm of a staghorn coral. And right within this circle that just popped up on the screen, you can see something that's known as a coral polyp. 
This is one single individual. You can see another polyp, another polyp, and another polyp. So when looking at this picture, you can imagine that there are 100 or maybe even 200 different organisms sitting in this one set image. And all of these polyps come together to form something that's known as a coral colony. This is really hard for some people to kind of wrap their minds around. Because when you're talking about a coral, are you talking about that singular organism, that singular animal that's known as a polyp? Or the colony itself, which is hundreds upon thousands of those polyps all living together in that colonial structure. And when talking about a reef, you can imagine that all those different colonies are now coming together to form that reef. In this image, you can imagine that there's maybe 15, 20, maybe even 30 different colonies of corals living together and forming that reef. And when you have a multitude of different reefs in one set area, and you really zoom out, it creates that coral reef ecosystem. It's kind of a really cool way to break down that overall um, setup of these different systems. But circling back or diving back to that polyp, I try to throw in as many bad dive puns as I can, we can go in and actually zoom in on one of those singular coral polyps. And we can see that there are a fair amount of anatomical structures that we can examine. In the center of every single one of these coral polyps is a mouth. They actually can feed, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. They have a bunch of different tentacles that surround the mouth that have these stinging nematocysts that they use to feed. There is that centralized stomach. There is a living tissue that covers the entire body of the coral itself. And beneath that living tissue, we have that calcium carbonate skeleton. But I really want us right now, for the purpose of this presentation, to kind of zoom in yet again and look at the overall tissues of those tentacles. And you can again see these nematocysts. Now the nematocysts are basically mini harpoon that guns that are spring loaded and ready to launch. And when a small little organism brushes up against this tentacle of that coral, that harpoon launches out, stings that organism and eventually paralyzes it and the coral can then put that tentacle down into its mouth to digest. So corals can actually feed. You may not realize it, but if you were down here working with us here at CRF and you were holding one of these fragments of corals during the restoration process that we do, that coral is stinging you the entire time you are holding it. The only thing is those nematocysts on the set corals that we work with down here aren't strong enough to actually puncture our skin and have us actually feel that stinging sensation. On the other hand, if you are familiar with fire coral and you have recently crashed into it, those nematocysts are very strong and can actually puncture your skin. And that's what results in that burning sensation and also why it's called fire coral. But we can also look at these zooxanthellae that live within the tissues. You can call them zooxanthellae, zooxanthellae, zooks, whatever floats your boat. But these zooxanthellae are actually a type of symbiont that lives within the tissue of the corals themselves. You can see this very zoomed in image on the left of those coral zooxanthellae. In the middle, you can see the zooxanthellae actually in those tentacles, all those weird little green blurbs are those Susan Belly. And also on the right, you see this beautiful image of a pillar coral. Now I'm taking so much time and saying that really fancy word over and over again, because this Susan Belly is really important for our stony corals. This Susan Belly is actually a photosynthetic dinoflagellate that is responsible for roughly 90% of the energy that the corals need to get on a day-to-day -day basis. There is this symbiont or symbiotic relationship where again, these zooxanthellae are providing corals the energy and in return, the zooxanthellae has somewhere to live. But when we look outside of that energy threshold, which is very apparent and very important for our corals, we can also look at the fact that this photosynthetic process actually results in the various colors that we all love to see when we are down here diving, snorkeling, or even looking over the side of a boat on a crystal clear day. This Susan belly results in those vibrant, beautiful colors that reefs are so famous for. But when we talk about Susan Thelly, one of the hot topics, again, a really bad pun here, 
is the overall issue of coral bleaching that really ties into these zoos and thalli. With these symbiotic relationships, there is actually a set temperature threshold that the zoos and thalli likes to be in. And when this temperature gets too high or sometimes too low, the corals get really stressed out because the zoos and thalli stops working properly. And you can imagine if you had something inside of your body that wasn't working and doing its, its main um, function, that's the word today, you would be stressed. Corals do the exact same thing because they have all this zoos and belly inside their tissues and it's not doing anything. And they're like, oh my God, oh my God, get it out. And they actually expel it. And you can kind of see that process in this image here on the right. Now with this bleaching, bleaching is sometimes natural. We do see historical events of bleaching happening and corals can recover. But why it's such a big topic in today's day and age is the fact that our oceans are warming way too rapidly and they're staying that temperature for an extended and prolonged period of time. And the coral can't go back and recover from that process because that temperature isn't going back to what it normally looks like. And with this bleaching, it can take place in a very fast and rapid period of time. You can see on the left, there is this beautiful, vibrant, healthy coral reef that was taken in uh, December of 2014. In the middle, you can see a bleached reef in February of 2015. And then in August of 2015, that entire reef is now dead. That's roughly a year. And that reef has spent probably hundreds upon thousands of years growing to be what it looks like in that image in the left. And in less than a year, it is all gone and it is all dead now. Wow. And JD, I just yeah. want to uh, interrupt because we do have oh, some God. questions already coming in from our live viewing audience. So the first question we have is um, just backing up to those nematocysts that we learned yeah. about. Why do certain coral species have a more have more potent nematocysts than others? Did they evolve this for a reason? Um, to my knowledge, it just comes down to the different aspects that they use for their own day-to-day -day survival. So some organisms have the stronger nematocysts for defense or for their own um, purposes of like actually being able to capture and bring in that prey. So it just depends on their kind of primary methodology. And also when you look at your um, like example of a fire coral, they don't rely as heavily upon that dinoflagellate to maintain their energy. So they need to have other ways to help bring in that energy that they need, if that makes okay. sense. Okay, great, thank you. So another question that we have um, is because of climate change, are corals migrating further north in the oceans? Are we seeing corals move at all from where they're found? Um, so not really. Unfortunately, with what's happening with climate change, the reefs are actually dying at such a rapid of a rate that we're not able to see that kind of movement up or down to areas that aren't as hot. Um, we do have deep water coral reefs that exist that have been there for a very long period of time, but for the overall sake of biology, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> and I think also something important to point out to our audience is that Coral reefs, and we're talking in particular, we're talking about uh, Florida coral reefs, which are primarily stony coral reefs. That mm -hmm. they're they're not like a shark, for example, a shark who can migrate, who can easily move in the ocean. Corals, for the most part, are sessile, or they kind of remain in place throughout their lifetime. And I was going to talk. Um, there's a little bit about spawning, but that's a really good point, Casey. Is while they are animals, they just can't get up and swim away if they are unhappy with those current parameters. They actually accrete their skeleton onto the reef itself. So once they kind of pick that one location, they can't be like, oh no, I don't like this real estate anymore. I'm gonna go somewhere else. They're basically stuck there for the remainder of their lives. <laughs> All right, that's good. And then one last thing, um, since we just, we're talking about the zooxanthellae and the ble and the bleaching events, um, are zooxanthellae evolving to tolerate higher water temperatures? Are we seeing that evolution happening? They are doing a lot of case studies in a variety of different labs to actually examine that. Um, unfortunately, that is a much higher level of scientific background than what I have in terms of my own personal um, wealth of knowledge but there is some really cool literature out there that should be available online where you can actually read those various different case studies and see the different results that they're finding. And I believe they are seeing some different clades that are more resistant and less resistant to the overall process of bleaching and kind of seeing how that dynamic is shifting. 
All right, great. Okay, so okay. back to the presentation. I'll yeah. give you the floor again. And feel free to interrupt whenever. I love being interrupted. Sounds <laughs> good. And keep those questions coming, everyone. Those were really, really fantastic. Awesome. Um, and while this is a really beautiful image, and beautiful is kind of a questionable word to use, and as much as I love this image coming from Huffington Post, I really want you all to focus in on that text in the middle of this slide. And the idea of a bleach reef being a dying reef isn't really the best way to describe it. With a bleach reef, I want you to think that it is a stressed uh, stress, that's the right word, hello. Stress reef, not a dying reef. You can imagine that if you are sick and you don't have access to medication or treatment, you are going to be stressed over a very, very long period of time. And if you don't have that treatment or whatever it may be, over a period of time of that ex uh, extreme amount of stress and pressure on your body, you are more likely going to die. But if you get that treatment, you're gonna feel better. It may take you a little bit of time, but eventually you'll shift back to what you normally were. That's basically the exact same thing that happens to our corals. If that temperature gets too hot, they bleach and it goes back down, that zooxanthellae can actually be recovered and that bleaching can then no longer be happening and that coral goes back to a healthy reef. But a lot of times what we see today is that temperature shift isn't going back down. It's only getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So there's no way for that coral to recover. But I really do want everyone to make sure that they know that that bleached reef doesn't mean that it's ultimately going to die. It just has a very more likely chance of dying. And now that I've actually depressed you all with the overall topic of coral bleaching, we can actually shift our attention to the overall ways that corals can reproduce. We are really lucky to see that a lot of the corals that we outplant here at CRF are actually reproducing and helping kickstart the natural recovery process of our reefs. But our corals, more specifically those hard corals, can reproduce in two different ways. The first of which is your asexual reproduction, otherwise known as fragmentation. Now this is a really big methodology that we use in the overall propagation of our corals here at CRF. You can see in this image, there is a diver who is catching a coral that has actually been broken up from the coral tree above it. And to kind of help you visualize what this fragmentation actually is, I like to use the overall analogy of houseplants. If you have a monstera that you accumulated in the peak of quarantine and you see that there are two leaves and you want to have two monsteras rather than one, you go ahead and cut and now you have two plants for the price of one. That's basically the exact same thing that happens with this asexual reproduction. In a natural setting, when we're not doing this restoration process, you can imagine that these stony corals are often known as a breakwater where they can help baffle a bunch of wave energy. And yes, while there are going to be parts that stay in that set location, as those waves crash over and over and over onto that coral, it will break small little pieces off. Those pieces will roll away. They'll get lodged somewhere else. And again, start that growth of that new colony. So that's fragmentation. But they also do sexual reproduction. And with sexual reproduction, let's see if that video will play. Oh, no. There's supposed to be a beautiful video playing here, but technology is not my friend. Um, with sexual reproduction, they basically will take their gametes and release them up into the water column. With this overall spawning, it's basically like being in a snow globe underwater. You will really have this synchronous event where all the corals will not be doing anything at one moment, and then you'll blink, and there will all be these little... Um, gametes floating around in the water column and they all will eventually come together they can fertilize each other they form this free swimming planular larva that eventually swims off and settles onto the reef to start that new coral colony and my apologies for not having this video work but that's your basic crash course in coral anatomy and coral biology i'm going to go ahead and shift my attention to the overall topic of biodiversity and the big reason why a lot of you are here today but I did want to take a moment just to pause to see if anyone had any more questions about the overall anatomy and biology side of coral. We certainly do. Okay, we've awesome. got some great questions coming in. Okay, so um, let's see. Ooh, I'm going to start with this one. Are scientists able to predict coral spawning like you can the weather? Yes, they can. Um, so each different species of coral, they've actually observed routinely spawning in different periods based on the location that that coral was going to be in and also based on the lunar cycle. Um, so most of our stony corals will spawn a few days after a full moon. I believe it's normally in 
July or August, I can't remember the exact date, but we basically, when we do stuff down here with CRF, we get these armadas of boats and we all go out after that set day or two after that full moon. We all sit around on the boat waiting for that time to come in. You can actually start to see when the corals are getting ready to release those gametes. You all hop in underwater and you literally sit there and wait and wait and wait. And again, you blink and it's doing nothing. And then you blink again and then all of those gametes have been released. Um, there are some really cool links online where you can actually find the different spawning cycles for a variety of different corals based on the location that they're actually in. Awesome. Okay. So then um, Blake wants to know, so talking about those Ozanthelli again, yeah. can you clarify? So Blake wants to know, do they not photosynthesize in heat and that's when the corals expel them? Can you maybe explain that bleaching event just yeah. a little bit uh, more for Blake? So it basically inhibits their overall ability to do that photosynthetic process. So then they're no longer able to photosynthesize because they're outside of that temperature range or that thermal tolerance zone. And that results in them, again, not being able to do that process. And then they basically just kind of sit around doing nothing to kind of simplify it. <laughs> all right. And then one more question, which yeah. I know you're going to touch on this because you're going to talk about all the fantastic work that um, CRF does or Coral Restoration Foundation. But the question is, it's it's a couple of different questions or threefold actually. You think growing more tolerant species of corals in labs and implanting them in the ocean is good? That's the first part of the question. And isn't it kind of like introducing an invasive species? And then the third part of that question is, could it damage the natives more through competition? Mm -hmm. um, so I, to some degree, can't actually comment on that because the overall idea of super corals is actually something that we here at CRF don't really focus in on. Our main focus is outplanting a multitude of different genetic uh, types of corals, otherwise known as genotypes, out onto the reef itself. So we actually don't do anything explicitly with that kind of growing, you know, a coral that's super resilient against bleaching and putting just that out onto the reef. We actually work with over 322 different genotypes of corals in our nurseries that we outplant back out onto the reef. That way there is a variety of genetic diversity that's put back out. So unfortunately, I don't explicitly work with that super coral aspect, so I can't comment too much on that. Okay, sounds good. All right, JD, I'm gonna let you have the floor again. Cool, and that was a really, really good question though. Kudos to whoever asked that because that was a really <laughs> well thought out question. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So now kind of shifting our attention to the overall biodiversity. Uh, for the past 500 million years, coral reef ecosystems have persisted and thrived in shallow seas. They are arguably one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet and one of the oldest ecosystems on the planet. And when looking at these, these biodiversity aspects, these reefs actually perform a numerous amount of vital ecosystem services. But before we look at the human side of things, we can actually look at the ocean side of things. So when looking at the overall coverage that these reefs have, only 0.2% of the ocean floor is covered by coral reefs. But at minimum, these reefs support roughly 25% of all marine animals that live in the ocean itself. Now, Casey, I'm gonna call you out on this one and I want you to tell me what your favorite animal is. And when I say animal, I mean ocean-based animal. <laughs> okay, um, favorite ocean-based animal. So I'm gonna choose one. Um... So I'm in Florida as well, um, but my specific favorite one is the peacock mantis. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I've never, have you ever seen one underwater? I've never seen one underwater. I have one here that, that lives with me on a daily basis, but um, peacock mantis shrimp blow my mind. They're one of the coolest animals I think out there, but also I really, really, really love nurse sharks too. Oh, I'll do both examples. Okay. Though. Um, so with Casey's two favorite animals, you can imagine that both of them directly rely on reefs. That mantis shrimp has its home on the reef. That nurse shark lives on the reef, it feeds on the reef, and you can imagine both of those organisms breed on that reef. Now those two examples are kind of easy because when you look at a reef, you're most likely going to go out and dive and see it. So let's use an example of something like a humpback whale. You don't always, I mean, some places, if you're lucky, you can go diving on a reef and see a humpback whale. But you can imagine that a lot of that time that the humpback whale lives is going to be out more towards the open ocean in deeper areas. It's not directly on that reef. 
But you can imagine that maybe the krill that that humpback whale feeds on has spawning grounds that are on the reef or small little fish that that whale eats has breeding grounds on that reef. So even though that whale may not be directly living or breeding or sleeping on that reef, its food source is still coming from our coral reef ecosystem. So that really kind of puts it into perspective, the overall interconnectivity that reefs have for all the different organisms that we know and love as ocean lovers. And in case you don't believe me, here are some really cool examples of some of the different organisms that you may see when you are out diving on reefs themselves. And these are actually all pictures that we have taken when we're out doing field work in our nursery and also on our various outplant sites. You can have things like your super small cleaner shrimp, your tasty Caribbean lobster. I know I'm not supposed to be saying that as a conservationist. You have your hermit crabs. You have my least favorite animal on the planet, your moray eels that live in and around the reefs themselves. You have squid, you have porcupine fish, you have barracuda, you have stingrays, you have beautiful schools of eagle rays. I would kill to be able to go underwater. I think there's over like 30 eagle rays in this image. And also everyone's favorite, the green sea turtle. So you can imagine all of that life directly depends on reefs themselves. And that's only a few of the animals that we normally see on a day-to-day -day basis. But we are also human, so we wanna see that overall importance of biodiversity for us. So at least 500 million people actually rely on coral reefs for food, coastal protection, as well as their overall livelihoods. And these reefs actually have an economic value that is estimated to be at least $9.9 .9 trillion on a global scale. All I can say is that's a lot of zeros. And more specifically, looking at our reef down here in Florida, we can see that this overall biodiversity and the numerous amounts of different corals that we have actually helps protect our coastline because these corals actually act as a breakwater for stir, uh, storm surge. So when we have hurricanes coming through, yes, we're still gonna have some water washing up on our coastline, but by having these reefs in place, it can actually break down that energy so we're not seeing as much coastal flooding. We also can see that Florida's coral reef is a habitat, a habitat for fish that is targeted by both recreational and commercial fisheries. And it also underpins our region's tourism industry because it's basically a playground for divers and snorkelers and everyone else in between. And to really show that aspect of the tourism industry, we can look at like someone myself. I'm originally from New Jersey. And if I wasn't so lucky and wasn't able to call the Florida Keys my home, but I wanted to come down here and go diving, I would have to hop on a plane and travel all the way down here from Jersey which means that I am paying an Uber driver from my home to the airport. I'm paying that airline company my airfare ticket. I'm paying for another Uber from the airport in Miami down here to the Keys. I'm paying a hotel, I'm paying restaurants, I'm doing a bunch of tourist activities and also paying the different dive shops that I'm going out on to see those reefs. And all of that money that I'm bringing in and giving to this local economy is solely because I want to come down here and see these reefs. And I want to see these reefs because they're biodiverse and beautiful. So you can really see where that money comes from and especially from that biodiversity aspect. <clears throat> and to kind of show you what this healthy reef normally looks like, this is a really nice image done by the Nature Conservancy. You can see that there is a lot of healthy coral and a lot of structure out on that reef, which means there's small little 3D space for small little organisms which bring in your medium organism, which brings in your large organ organisms. And then you have your dolphins and your sharks and you have Casey's mantis shrimp. With all of that beautiful biodiversity that we have underwater, again, we have those divers and those snorkelers who want to come down and photograph it and take selfies with corals like me you see that that wave energy is being baffled. So you have the overall creation of a safe harbor and a safe and sturdy coastline. There's a lot of biodiversity out on that reef. So fishermen can go out and hopefully uh, fish sustainably and bring stuff to put on their plates and also have jobs. And with that healthy reef ecosystem, we often see a healthy mangrove system, which really helps keep the overall coastline in place, which leads to the creation of a safe foundation for us to live on as we do down here in the Florida Keys. But unfortunately, we really are seeing a rapid level of degradation of our reefs, and that's really causing a huge drop in the biodiversity that we are seeing out on these reefs. 
So in this first image, you can see a healthy and thriving diagram of a coral reef. You can see all these different herbivores, you can see all these different fish, and you can see all of this coral structure and coral space. But as we lose our herbivores from overfishing and different forms of pollution, you'll see that that reef isn't as abundant. And without those herbivores, we start to see that there is an explosion of algal growth. This algae is a huge competitor for our corals, and it actually will start to overgrow and smother the live coral that we are seeing. As the smothering process happens, our corals that are all alive start to die off, which leads to overall reef erosion and subsequently structural degradation. And we shift from a coral dominated reef to an algal dominated reef. And unfortunately, that's really what we're seeing down here. So you can see those corals are gone, but that biodiversity also vanishes. And in case you don't believe me, this is an image of Carey's Fort 1975, or back in 1975. And you can see this insane amount of biodiversity. You can see all of that coral, you can see all of those fish. It's a beautiful, healthy, thriving ecosystem. But when we jump ahead to our most recent image of Carey's Fort at that exact same site, all of that is gone. There is no coral, there are no fish, there are no other organisms, and that reef has been degraded. And to again contrast from that previous image, you can see now with this degraded reef, all of that structure is gone, which means that there are no small little nooks and crannies for small little fish, which means you have no medium fish, which means you have no large fish. So all those really cool organisms that we wanna see is now gone and that bio biodiversity has been lost. Divers and snorkelers are gonna go somewhere else to see other things and other healthy reef ecosystems while they last. That wave energy isn't being baffled, so those people on those boats are probably getting seasick like I do. Those mangroves have been washed away, which means the overall coastline has now been extremely degraded, and that foundation that we want to live upon, like we do down here, has now been cracked, and we're no longer safe down here in the Keys. So when we restore a coral reef here at CRF, we are basically working to mitigate and control those different aspects. We are first and foremost helping provide habitat for marine life. We're providing that structure and those little nooks and crannies to bring back those organisms. We are helping to protect our coastline by bringing back those wave energies or baffle, bafflers for those wave energies. We are helping support the tourism and the diving industry. We are providing food for reef dependent fish, which means that more organisms will come back. And again, we'll see that increase in biodiversity. And with that increase in biodiversity, we can have individuals come back out who can go fish and have stuff to be brought to our plates and also people who can have jobs in different forms of livelihoods. But that's basically biodiversity in a nutshell. Um, I'm imagining there's probably gonna be some more questions for me. So I am more than happy to have whatever you have for me. All right. Yes, we do have a ton of questions coming in. And thank you, JD, for that <laughs> incredibly powerful slideshow um, to just really drive home the importance of coral reefs and, and the amount of biodiversity that they house out there in the oceans and, and making for a healthy ocean, healthy ecosystem, and even a healthy economy if we want to, you know, take it to the human level. Yeah. So we do have quite a few questions coming in. So let me... Um, let me start right here is, okay, here's a great question. Do you feel that Aquarius can help coral by raising awareness to people that are both near and far from the ocean to protect them? A hundred and ten percent. We need every single human being on the planet speaking about what's happening to our reefs. So whether you are in the landlocked state of I almost said Texas, but that's not landlocked. Insert landlocked state here because my geography is I'm horrible. from North Dakota, so you can use there you that go. as an example. If you're in the landlocked state of North Dakota and you are an aquarist or you're even just someone who's passionate about reefs, talk to anyone and everyone you know. My family knows that when I come home for Christmas, the only thing I'm going to be talking about is corals the entire time. You really are someone who can bring about that change, whether you're challenging someone to cut out the overall amount of plastic that they're using on a day-to-day -day basis, or just to be more conscious about what's happening to our reefs and getting them to actually care. So definitely Aquarius, but really anyone in general. You have this information and you can share this with others and get them to want to care about reefs. Because when you're down here in the Keys, 
if you don't really know what's happening, you will look out at that beautiful blue coastline and think, wow, it must be a really healthy reef. But we're not, you know, you're not directly seeing what's happening below the surface. So definitely use your voice and get people to care. Excellent. Uh, we have another question, and this is a really good one. Uh, yes, besides fauna and coral restoration by humans, are there any animals in the ocean that help to transplant or transport corals to other reefs? So unfortunately not. I think that would be really cool if some organisms could, you know, go through and clip off corals for us and put them somewhere else. Uh, but unfortunately, as of right now, evolution hasn't come to our aid in that capacity. <laughs> but that would be a really cool thing to happen. Right. Absolutely. I agree. OK, so let's see. Back to these questions. Um, how can students who don't dive or snorkel get involved? Yeah. Um, so if you're down here in the Keys, I definitely recommend you stop in and visit us just so you can learn a little bit more about the work that we do. Um, and you say people who don't dive and snorkel or just dive? Um, I think they said, let's see here, who don't dive or snorkel. Okay. Um, you can also, if you find yourself down here, we do have a wide variety of different volunteer opportunities for you to get involved with us. Um, so we do have land-based volunteering where you can actually work alongside our land-based components to helping us build a variety of different structures that we use for the restoration process and also helping us with data entry, photo tagging, and a bunch of other really cool educational outreach. But if you are just looking to get involved, but not explicitly down here in the keys, I would say just to kind of, again, like what I said for that uh, earlier question, of just using your voice and helping others be empowered and educated on what's happening to our reefs and also to our ocean as a whole. Um, you can reach out to legislature and help you know, push for more environmentally and eco-conscious laws, or just again, educating your friends and family about ways that they can help reduce their overall impact on our reefs and our oceans. And obviously a really easy way for anybody out there to get involved is to follow Coral Restoration Foundation on all different platforms out there. Um, of course, they do a lot of great postings out there to help educate about the reefs. Share those posts with your friends and family. Um, our partners and friends at UF Earth Systems and Scientists in Every Florida School have fabulous programs for Florida schools in particular. So those of you tuning in uh, right now and are based in Florida, please check out at UF Earth Systems and uh, follow everything that Scientists Never Florida School does, as well as here at Earth Echo International. We have a lot of great opportunities for young people, and most of our programs and projects are run virtually, um, especially now uh, due to the pandemic, but we are looking forward to getting back to normalcy and seeing people in person, including doing some boots on the ground, habitat restoration in various states. And in just a little bit, I'll talk about one more opportunity that we have here at Earth Echo to get everybody involved in biodiversity in your own backyards. And just okay. to, not, not to cut you off, Casey, sorry. Yep. Um, to circle back to it, I'm a really big proponent for education. I really think education is kind of the main aspect for the future of our reefs and our oceans and realizing that all of you currently sitting and listening to this talk, you are all the future of our oceans. So getting involved and empowering yourselves can really bring about that positive change. Agreed. Now we've got a really good question from Mariana. Yeah. Uh, Mariana asks, uh, CRF works on restoring coral reefs, making coral trees, such as those ones right behind you, JD, and reintroducing them into nature, correct? Yes. If so, how do you choose your restoration or reintroduction sites? Um, so that comes from a fair amount of actually governmental decisions and based on the wide variety of different grants that we receive. And those grants have um, specific parameters on where we need to outplan or where they want us to focus in on. Um, we actually are working with a wide variety of other restoration organizations down here in the Keys for the Mission Iconic Reefs. And those reefs are seven different reefs throughout the entire Florida Keys that are being primarily, again, focused on for that set um, grant itself. So a lot of it does come from those grants. Awesome. OK. And uh, Blake out there says that they want to volunteer with you at CRF and they are planning on getting dive certified this summer and maybe signing up. Are there any age restrictions uh, to volunteering with CRF or um, any things like practice dives they need under their belt? Yeah. 
Um, so perfect question for me because I run the volunteer program. Um, so with the volunteer program, we have two different components, our land volunteer program, as well as our dive volunteer program. With the land volunteer, you want to be at least 16 years old. And then also with the dive volunteer, you want you to be at least 18 years old. For the dive volunteer program, there are a couple of other requirements that come with it, like having at least uh, 30 log dives. We want you to have your CPR and first aid, your O2, dive insurance, as well as all of your own gear. Again, a lot of that comes down to the overall safety and standards that we have imposed for our organization. That way, in case something were to happen, all individuals on our boats are properly trained and know how to kind of respond to a situation. Knock on wood, we've been very lucky down here. But if that kind of seems a little bit daunting, we also do have these really amazing programs that are called recreational dive programs. The recreational dive program is basically a one day restoration adventure where there's going to be a morning of educational and hands on training. And then in the afternoon, you actually get to go out on a charter boat with us and you get to help us in our nurseries and pending weather actually go and outplant corals back out onto the reef. That has a little bit less in terms of overall requirements and parameters when we're looking at individuals to come and join us. But both opportunities are definitely great ways to get involved with our work. Awesome. And Blake, one last question from Blake is, yeah, definitely. You know, do you work outside of Florida as well? Um, as of right now, we are solely based down here in Florida, but you never know. There could be some more chance for us to expand elsewhere. Absolutely. All right. We have one last question to wrap okay. things up and bring it home. Um, this is kind of a doozy. So, um, Colding asks, does CRF use fragmentation to restore corals? If so, how do you combat the low genetic diversity that results from fragmentation since the polyps all have the same genotype? So that kind of comes back to the overall topic of how many different genotypes we actively work with out in our nurseries themselves. So like I said before, we have over 322 different genotypes that we actively grow and outplant back out onto our reefs. So in doing so, we're helping introduce a wide array of different genotypes and genetic diversity, words are hard today, back out onto the reef itself. Short and simple. <laughs> All right, great. Okay, so I'm just double checking. Um, yeah. uh, uh, Mariana wants to know, do you have any exchange programs or even um, internship programs? Perfect question. Um, so in terms of an exchange program, not really. Uh, we do pre-pandemic have the opportunity for individuals who are not based in Florida to come down and be visiting volunteers with us. That way, if you are coming all the way from Australia or Canada or wherever it may be, you can still come down and volunteer with us. Unfortunately, due to current restrictions with the pandemic, we're not able to actually support that program. But we do also have an internship program. Um, I actually, before my time as a staff member, was an intern with CRF, and it's kind of how I fell in love with coral and coral restoration. Um, but the internships themselves are four month semester internships. Uh, you basically do everything and anything. You are working alongside the heads of restoration and science for the outplanting and monitoring process of our corals. You're working alongside other team members in our nurseries. You're doing educational outreach events. You're helping run those recreational dive programs. You're assisting with the training process of our volunteers. You're learning all about communications and social media. You're learning all about how to solicit donations and how to work with um, donors and get grants and everything else in between. Um, so the volunteer program is definitely a really, really, really cool way to learn more about CRF, but also more so the world of restoration. And again, all the opportunities, the volunteer internship and dive program can all be found on our website. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, JD. This has been uh, really enlightening. Thank you so much for um, teaching us all about corals, um, even back down to biology 101. I love it. <laughs> Such a great lesson, I think, to put out there in the world. And um, really important to, to know that, that coral reefs, yes, they're diverse, they're biodiverse, they are super important, not only for Florida, where coral reefs can be found, or Australia, but really for the health of our ocean. And really, the ocean is the lifeblood of our planet. So I think we all need to remember that. So thank you so much, JD. It was an absolute pleasure talking with you today. 
I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. All right, sounds good. Now, for those of you out there who still um, are hungry for more and wanna get involved, here at Earth Echo International, we have a great opportunity for middle school students in the US called the R Echo Challenge. So let's learn a little bit about that. I'm Philippe Cousteau, and I'm so excited to announce that Earth Echo International's Our Echo Challenge is open for entries. Over the last 40 years, 50% of the biodiversity on Earth has been lost. This presents an enormous threat to the future of our planet. And the Our Echo Challenge is a national program that empowers students to do something about it, to protect and restore biodiversity, and crucially, get the funding to do it. The Our Echo Challenge empowers teams of middle school students to explore their community, identify threats to local species, and then submit an idea for a project that will help to restore a healthy ecosystem. Ten finalist teams will join Earth Echo International to present their ideas, and the top <laughs> team will be awarded grants to turn their projects into a reality. Teachers and educators, go to www.ourechochallenge.org and register your team to join our STEM competition and submit your plans to change the world. And we have entries open until April 22nd, so be sure to visit ourechochallenge.org to find out more to explore and protect biodiversity in your own backyard. And of course, we want you to be sure to stay connected with not only Coral Restoration Foundation, but also Earth Echo International and scientists in every Florida school. Here are all of the places you can find us on social media. Be sure to visit our websites to find out more information about all of our exciting programs, including special events just like this one. And before you sign off of YouTube, don't forget to smash that subscribe button. So on behalf of Earth Echo International, Coral Restoration Foundation, and scientists in every Florida school, thank you all so much for joining us. Bye-bye.